In this procedural update, we join Dr. Daron Scher, orthopaedic surgeon specialising in knee and shoulder surgery. In this segment, I'm going to introduce you to the examination of the knee joint. The knee is a weight-bearing limb and should be examined both standing, sitting and lying down. Exposure is very important. The patient's shoes and socks must be removed and you need to see as much of the quadriceps muscle as possible while maintaining the patient's modesty. We look specifically for muscle wasting, for quadriceps muscle wasting, for an effusion or for any abnormalities at the foot such as a flat foot or a high arch foot which may be affecting the knee. We ask the patient to put their feet together and we see here that as her knees touch her heels don't, indicating that she has a subtle valgus alignment of her legs. If the legs were, the heels were together and the knees were apart, that would be a varus alignment, somewhat like a cowboy riding a horse. You can also have physiological alignment, which is fairly close to where we are, and males and females have slightly different alignment um, of their legs. Having inspected from the front, we would ask the patient to turn around. Keep going. And we inspect from the back, again, looking for hamstring muscle wasting, popliteal fossa swelling, seeing that the popliteal creases are at the same height, looking for calf muscle wasting and any problem with the hind foot. We then get the patient to turn sideways and ask them to straighten the knee as much as they can to make sure that there is no fixed flexion deformity that they can get the knee fully straight. Being a weight-bearing joint, we ask the patient to go for a walk and we watch for a limp or any abnormality. Please turn around and walk back to me. Very good. The phases of gait are the heel strike, the flat foot or stance phase, the toe off, and then the swing through, which is on the other leg. And particularly if a patient has a painful leg, they will have a shortened stance phase, which is called an antalgic gait. That's the primary pa pain pattern that we're looking for in this situation. There are also other ones like a short leg gait or a stiff leg gait which are important to look for, but an antalgic gait is the shortened stance phase that we particularly look for. Having had the patient walk, you then ask them to sit down. This is slightly different because we're not doing look-feel move in the situation because we want to see the patient's flexion range of motion and feel their patellofemoral joint before we formally lie them down and examine them by palpation. In this situation, what I want to do is touch the patella and ask the patient to straighten out the knee. Lift your leg up in the air, and I see whether it achieves full extension or not, and I feel for any crunching in the kneecap. Uh, leg back down again for me. The other thing that I do is check to see whether the patella tracks laterally, that there might be some instability. So if they straighten the leg up again, and I watch for the patella to track outwards over here, called J tracking, of the patella. Bend your leg back down again. Thank you very much. Once we have the patient lying down, we can inspect more closely for any scars or sinuses, and we can watch the patient's range of motion. So if I could ask you just to bend your knee up for me as far as you can, and then come back down. So you can see that she has a comfortable full range of motion, which is going to be useful later for when I'm going to test her range of motion. The next thing is to feel, and I'm going to feel each anatomical structure. So I feel the patella around all of its edges, and it's important to be watching the patient's face during this phase of the examination because you're looking for pain. And if I'm looking over somewhere like this and the patient grimaces, I'm going to miss that. So always look up at the patient when you're palpating each of these sub um, areas. So that's the patella, the patella ligament, the tibial tubicle. I then flex the knee and I just control the patient's foot with my leg over here. I'm now going to palpate the rest of the structures, the medial femoral condyle and again I'm looking at the patient while I'm doing this. The medial joint margin, the medial tibial condyle, the pes anserinus bursa, the lateral tibial condyle, the lateral femoral condyle, the lateral joint margin, the proximal tibiofibular joint. Having completed the examination of the knee inflection, the last thing to do is in 30 degrees of extension, let the leg relax, 
palpate the lateral joint margin over here, again looking at the patient's face. Now this is a very sensitive test for lateral meniscal pathology because in this position the lateral meniscus is somewhat extruded and quite painful. By the time you flex the knee up to 90 degrees that meniscus can drop back in and not be painful anymore and there is a chance of missing the diagnosis of a lateral meniscal tear. We'll come back down and look for an effusion now. An effusion or swelling of the knee is never normal. There should be less than five mils of fluid. There are three increasing tests that you can do looking for an effusion. The first is the wipe or swipe test. What you do is you wipe the fluid from the knee into the suprapatella pouch. That clears this gutter of any fluid at all. You then want to wipe the fluid back into the knee by taking it out of the suprapatella pouch and watching for a bulge at that part of the knee. This is for a small effusion. If you get a larger effusion, you won't see the fluid flow and therefore the wipe test won't be useful for you. If there's a medium effusion, then what you need to do is be able to cross fluctuate. So you bring the fluid down from the suprapatella pouch, put your fingers and thumbs on either side of the knee, and then squeeze backwards and forwards, feeling for the fluid flowing underneath your fingers. As a very small effusion won't give you cross fluctuation, and a very large tense effusion won't give you cross fluctuation because the fluid can't travel. So the last thing to look for is what's called a patella tap, and that's when there's a very large effusion. If you milk the, f the, the fluid down from the suprapatella pouch underneath the patella, the patella is now sitting up off the femur. If you then push down on the patella, the patella sinks through that fluid and hits the femoral condyle, and you actually feel a clunk as the two bones touch together, and that's called a patella tap. There has to be enough fluid to separate the patella from the femur, so in a medium or small effusion, this will not be useful. If any of the tests is found to be positive, there's no point trying to do one of the other tests because they're unlikely to be positive, and then you can grade the effusion into small, medium, or large. Palpating the medial joint margin, you look for tenderness of the meniscus and I'm looking at the patient's face the whole time I'm doing that. I then abduct and externally rotate and again feel for that meniscal tenderness and that this point here is typically where the patient goes ouch and that's how you know that they have a meniscal tear. While you're there you check the MCL femoral insertion and MCL tibial insertion and you do the same thing for the lateral collateral ligament. We then go through the anterior and posterior draw. We make sure that the hamstring tendons are relaxed, that the tibia is sitting in line with the femur where it should be, and we pull anteriorly on the tibia. In this situation, there's less than a millimetre of translation. If we're going to do a posterior draw, we need to be sure that the starting point is correct. So using the thumb sign, we feel the tibial condyle is sitting in front, and we push backwards looking for a sag posteriorly. We then move to the Lockman test. The Lockman test is the most sensitive test to use when looking for an anterior cruciate ligament injury. It's done with the knee bent at 30 degrees of flexion as seen in this photograph, making sure that the patient's heel rests comfortably on the examination bench. Essentially, the thigh is held still while the tibia is pulled forward and the amount of movement is noted. The quality of the end point at the end of the movement is described as either firm or soft and is always compared to the other knee. If the movement of the tibia on the femur comes to a sudden stop, this is described as a firm end point. A soft end point almost always indicates a torn ACL. This is used in combination with the anterior drawer and the pivot shift to confirm the diagnosis. We then carry on with the pivot shift test. And the pivot shift test is done with the leg in extension, internal rotation with a valgus stress. Now what this does is it allows the uh, anteromedial edge of the tibia to be subluxed forward. And what we do when we flex the knee is we then get the knee to drop back into a reduced position. So patients may be very apprehensive about this. You can help them by putting your thumb underneath their leg and the fingers on top there so they have a bit more proprioceptive feedback but there's some patients that it's just too worrying for them to do it when they're awake and you can only do it under anaesthetic. But generally speaking, internal rotation valgus, 
look there and as the knee goes beyond 30 degrees you'll see the pop as that tibia which has been subluxed drops back into an anatomical position. You've been watching another Medical Observer procedural update. Medical Observer brings life to medicine.